Hey everybody, Scout Crafty here again. It's Friday, TGIF. Thank God it's Friday. Made it through another week and we have a, a pretty big episode to get to today. So I want to get started right away, but I want to tell you a story about what happened to me. And I say last night, but it was actually about 4.30 in the morning this morning. Uh, I was out for my walk and um, I was walking uh, about uh, half a mile from the house and I saw something in the street that looked odd i said and, and i was walking actually in the street and it, it, i said what is that in the street and it was a, a manhole cover and not more than 20 feet away was an open manhole and i was like that was always a fear of mine is to hit an open manhole if you've ever hit one before with your vehicle it could do some serious damage. You could blow a tire, you could tear out a tie rod or, you know, lower control arm. You could really do some damage to your car. Um, and this was a large one. You know, some manholes are smaller than others. This was a big manhole. Would have swallowed up anybody that hit it. Would have did some serious damage. So I went into panic mode. It's like, look, at it was right in the middle of the intersection. That, not so that your car would pass over it, that a wheel would hit. It was just off-centered enough that it was a real hazard. So I quick, uh, I ran over and grabbed a garbage can and uh, put it in front. And then I was flagging some vehicles. There wasn't many. It was early in the morning, flagging some vehicles to, you know, go, go around it. And uh, I knew where there was some cones about a half a block away. So I ran up, got some cones, and uh, I surrounded it. And then I called 911. Um, 911 is always funny here in the city when you call. They're always trying to point you off to another agency. <laughs> you know, they don't, it's a strange thing. You know, no, it's nobody's job here. Now, you know what it's like? It's like doctors. Remember years ago, you went to the doctor and the doctor would take care of your problem. But now a doctor is like the... Uh, a switchboard operator. When you go to a doctor, they tell you what specialist they want to send you to, you know? So it's the same thing, you know, you call 911, they're trying to figure out who to call. Anyway, the fire department, they wind up calling. I'm waiting there because I don't want anybody to get in, you know, hit this uh, manhole cover. And the fire department comes and I was like, okay, good, you know, there's four guys on the truck between them and me. We can wrestle this. This I could not move this cover. It had a way over 100 pounds, but it was upside down and there was no lip to get your fingers under. You needed a pry bar or a jimmy bar or something. So I said, okay, we'll be able to... Fire department didn't want to touch it. You know, they were like, uh, yeah, that's not our job. That's uh, environmental protection. I, of course, there was somebody else that they had, you know, so I was like, look, I, as long as you guys are here, I'm out of here. So, but they left right after I left. They left the cones there and stuff. And I was like, it's funny how people, it, isn't it amazing how today, I don't know if it was. it's because of a, a litigious thing, because there's so many lawsuits and stuff, but nobody wants to do anything. Everybody wants to point it off to something. It's not my job. It's somebody else's job. And I understand. It was the same way where I used to work. Uh, and with us, it was a union thing. You know, you didn't want to uh, take away another union person's job because if you do that job just as a favor today, tomorrow... They'll eliminate the person that was supposed to do that job, and now that'll become your job. So I understand that, but man, I was like, uh, how do you not, you know, want to cover this hole up? You know, we could have put that cap back on, the four of us. I don't know, the five of us or whatever. So that was an interesting story for, for this morning. But today we got a bunch of things to get to. The first thing I want to get to is a good friend of the show by the name of Brian Bins. He asked a, a while ago, he said, you know, about um, using... The little anvil on the vice, you know, why I suggested not to use that as an anvil. And he just said, you know, he wanted to know the reasons why and whatnot. And I, you know what? I forgot to, to address that. So I want to address that right away. Let's get to that now. Now, Brian's question revolved around uh, this little area back here. You see back here on most vices, they have a little flat what they call an anvil section on the vice and um and that's made for light tapping and things like that and to a lot of people don't realize that there are different types and styles of vices now these two vices here are very common vice styles of vices and most vices that you'll get are made of either a cast or a uh um a ductile iron that's uh over here and and that's what the body of the vice is made from now because cast iron is a little bit on the brittle side they make the vices uh, as big as they can 
and uh, to make up for the fact that the uh, cast iron is not an extremely strong steel. Now, there are some German vices, things like that, that are made from a, a different type of a steel, uh, which is like a drawn or forged steel. And when you buy a forged steel vise, they're much smaller. They don't have to be so big because they're, they're very strong, but they're much more expensive. But um, these vices here, standard cast vices. And when you have a cast vise, that means your little anvil section back here is also going to be made of a cast material, which means they uh, can be brittle. Now, there are some vices that are made to be banged on. They're made from a forged steel, the whole vise, and uh, most notably are blacksmith post vices. Now, if you ever seen those, those are like a drawn or wrought iron, or iron steel that's made to be banged on and to be twisted and mauled, and they're super heavy duty. Uh, they're not usually used in the uh, bench uh, vice or down in the uh, the shop here that we use, but they're used in for blacksmith applications. And this uh, vice here, probably the best vice ever made, and I'm a little prejudiced because my great grandfather bought it. Uh, this is a this is a, a, a same steel as like a, a blacksmith vice. It's like a forged steel. You could bang on this all day long. Smooth as silk. And uh, this vise here is made for that. So um, certain vices are made. You can you don't have to worry about chipping a piece off because, it, again, it is a, uh, a forged steel. Now, every uh, vise that has a little anvil here is meant to take some kind of uh, tapping, pounding. If you had to straighten out a nail or you had to tap something like that, that's what you would use this kind of anvil for. It's not meant to do any serious pounding. And you could tell, if you look at the side profile, here you could see that side low profile, you know with any pounding, this is going to break or chip right off. So it's not meant for that. Um, what you want to use, for, and, and again, it's meant for small tapping. If you want to straighten out a, something small, a nail or something like that, that's what these are meant for. Uh, as a convenience. By no means are these meant to do any serious pounding. And this one here has no lips on it, but still, again, it's not meant for heavy banging. Now, not everybody can afford an anvil in the shop. That's why everybody should have at least a piece of railroad track. And this makes a fantastic surface for banging and straightening out. You don't have to worry about damaging it. Um, it's, uh, it comes in handy so many times. This is what you need to do any kind of banging on the shop. Uh, get yourself a, a section of railroad track. You can get them anywhere. This is a small, uh, railroad track. This one here is a, uh, a, a narrow gauge, but it's a, a little bit longer piece for longer work. And of course, this is your standard rail right here. This is only about six inches long, but boy, I've used this thousands of times. This really comes in handy for any kind of banging. So that's what you need. Forget, don't ever try and bang anything heavy duty on your vice. Hope that helps, Brian. Now, last week we did this beautiful serviceman thermometer by the Jazz P. Marsh Company. And a couple people said that they thought jazz was short for James, which it usually is. And But you can't, you know, you can't assume with a lot of times when you look back. And I was wondering, why do you think that James cut his name short. It couldn't be to save space, so, you know, on the fonts and stuff. It's only two letters. And in all the documents I can find, I only found a couple that had his full name. It was either JP or Jazz. Very few, only one or two documents could I find his full name of James. So why do you think he didn't want his full name James on his inventions? Now, speaking of Jazz P. Marsh, a lot of you were very interested in that thermometer, especially that the remote probe. And so I pulled out a couple of my uh, remote probe thermometers. Now, a uh, uh, funny thing about these, back in the 50s and 60s, now, they have uh, remote thermometers now, uh, digital, that are very nice. In fact, this one here was given to me by my good friend Richie Kemp. And uh, a beautiful indoor-outdoor thermometers. They work great, and they're wireless and whatnot. But back in the day, they had these, uh, these, uh, um, especially uh, like Air Guide was a uh, a popular one. And they had these indoor-outdoor thermometers that you put by a window, and then you ran the probe outside. And it had a uh, the, the red was uh, indoor and the blue was outdoor and uh, the temperatures would you would see the difference in temperature and they had all different types. Uh, here is and these are new old stock and it's funny because 
these were always given away as gifts, like very common around Christmas time to give these away as gifts. And um, usually when it's Christmas time, it's cold out and people say, well, I'll put it up in the spring. They put it in a the drawer. They forget about it. So there were a ton of these new old stock available like now on eBay and things like that. It's funny how that works. And look at this one here. I love when it comes in the original box. You can see here, this was from June 1972 when it was 26 cents to mail this, you know, now it would be 10 times that at least. And here we have James, not Jazz, James H. Brush. And uh, he was at <laughs> Susquehanna, Pennsylvania. Okay. And look at that. Look at even the, the nice font on that typewriter, whoever uh, um, wrote it. But the Thermometer Corporation of America made this one. Here's another. And this one here, again, uh, new old stock, and it came with the probes. And I'm going to talk about how these probes work in a minute. But isn't that a beautiful uh, uh, thermometer to hang by your window? And, and again, this one's an easy reader with the, uh, the wide... Uh, either mercury or alcohol, whatever they used, depending on the thermometer. It was easy to see with certain ones, and they were just nice thermometers. You know, I, I love the way these look, and they still do work, and they all have the probe. This one here, you can see that type of probe. It's got a bit brass probe, and how a lot of these worked is... Um, what they would do is they would put a, a liquid in here and it was a thin tube and it was armor plated because you don't want to kink that tube. And it, there could either be gas or liquid that would uh, go right into the bottom right there. You could see of the outside side of the, uh, of the thermometer. And if I held it, you would see it go up, you know, by touching it, it would, uh, the thermal capacity expands and it would uh, it would raise the temperature. But when you're looking for these, try and find ones that are close together. Because if you see a lot of these, you'll see that, you know, something happened and, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, mercury is all out of skew or something like that. But very interesting. These still work to this day. Now, the probes that came with these are, are very interesting because a lot of these, they have to be sealed. And sometimes through the years, if they're not sealed or whatever, and you see how much cable there is that this has to go through, the gas or the liquid has to go through to get this to move up. So they're not super fast responsive, especially these, the commercial ones are better. But um, there are different types that they have uh, of uh, like thermal couplers and thermal probes. Uh, some are electrical. The electrical ones work off of a resistance and they're much quicker. And that's the ones that we deal with a lot of times with the uh, digital ones. They have a, uh, an electrical sensor that will send it and it, 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 uh, how that works is through resistance. Okay, to demonstrate how a thermal coupler electric works, uh, I have a piece of wire here. This is regular wire off of a Chinese soup container. And, uh, but the ones, the wire they use is much better suited for the application. But uh, this will show how it works. Now, you could see the ohms rating. We have 0.2 ohms, very low resistance on this wire between the two probes. I'm going to hit this with some heat here. And when I do, watch how this number, the resistance will increase. And the reason is... Because the atoms in here right now are pretty stable and the electricity is flowing from point A to point B. And that's showing the resistance. Now, when I put the heat on here, the atoms will jump around creating a blockage. And so the electricity will have to get past the, the running, jumping atoms to get to here. And that'll increase the, uh, the number over here. So let's do that now. I'm uh, going to fire up the torch. Watch how quickly it goes up. And this is just a, a small test. Okay, here we go. Now look at that number climb. Whoa, look at the resistance. And watch how quickly it drops when it cools off. That is amazing, isn't it? Just from heat. You see the resistance, how that causes heat. And that's the same thing why you have to watch wires in your your house because if there's too much resistance too much heat that's where fire okay start. so we had the capillary action here where you have the fluid going up the tube we had the thermal couple which is the uh electric thermal couple which is the uh voltage the impedance difference and now we have my favorite and this is called the bimetallic strip and it sounds complicated but all it is it's bimetallic that means two separate metals steel and copper 
Uh, you can have any two metals that are different, but um, what happens is, is copper expands at a much greater rate than steel does. So when you bond these two together and you add heat, what happens is the copper is going to expand and the steel isn't going to expand as much and it's going to move. It's going to bend. And that's how thermostats and some old time uh, mechanical thermometers work with a bimetallic strip. And I'm going to add some heat here to show you how this bends and then we'll cool it off with a little water show you how quick it straightens up okay first we're going to add some heat to it see how it's straight let's add some heat i'm going to do both sides so you don't think i'm going on one side or the other now you can see it's starting to curve a little bit right as it gets warmer it'll curve more and more and you can see here it's curving because the copper is expanding at a greater rate than the steel Kind of heat up both sides equally, and spinning it around. See that there? Now that's how they get thermal switches to work. Now you see the curve in it? There's quite a curve, right? Now, now I'm going to put some water on there and I'm going to show you how quickly this will straighten out. Now you see the curve in there, right? Again, now I'm taking some water. Just drip it onto the, cool it off a little bit, both sides. And look at that. As it comes back to normal temperature, it straightens out. So that's called a bimetallic mechanism. So there you go. It's almost, it's almost like being back in science class, right? This is the kind of stuff I used to do with the scouts. I just, I love this stuff. I love figuring out and learning how simple things work. Um, I was a little bummed out this week because I found out we're not having our tool meet, uh, our Long Island tool meet again because of COVID. And that's the second time that's been canceled. That's like, it's been five months. You know, I'm starting to think we, we need another club. I'm, maybe we should try and start a tool collecting club somewhere like maybe in, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, or Jersey, somewhere, get some kind of building and, you know, once a month go there and meet up and sell and talk about tools. It'd be a lot of fun, right? I'm sure a lot of you would be on board. Anyway, uh, thanks so much for tuning in. I uh, appreciate it, and I hope you have a great weekend. Take care now. Bye-bye. Come on, Mama. Go get those two. Come on, bring them back. Come on.